things are not as they should be. The world around us, in our lives, our homes, our neighborhoods, our city, things are not as they should be. But it's not just around us, it's in us, right? Things are not as they should be. And so what is the problem? What's causing things to not be as they should be? Well, let's just first acknowledge what is the challenge, right? Like the reality is even when we think about people in need, right, the issues of poverty and homelessness, you, we are seeing this as a nation. You can, you can put trillions of dollars into the crisis of poverty and joblessness and people in need and not fix the problem, not change the economy or transform the, the culture. In, in fact, it seems to exacerbate it, right? Meaning you, you dump, as a nation, we're pouring trillions of dollars into trying to respond to the needs of our economy dramatically affected by the restrictions brought on by the pandemic. And what you get is skyrocketing inflation, right? Where uh, we were already experiencing that, right? With the cost of healthcare skyrocketing, cost of education and other basic life needs going through the roof. And yet um, incomes staying primarily stagnant. And now, as you dump trillions of dollars into, you know, basically national debt, now we have an even greater rise in inflation where other things that weren't cost costing more and more are now costing us significantly more. And, and so what is going on? Uh, as a nation, you could see this, right? This, this putting trillions of dollars in, all that does is puts us into greater debt right? So now it's not just you in debt, but it's your kids and your grandkids and great-grandchildren in debt. And so what is, what is the real crisis? Well, a already existing problem that was not being solved was exacerbated by the restrictions of the pandemic, right? Where we saw 75 million people lose their jobs. 200,000 businesses permanently closed. And this is personal, right? Because this is stores you went to and shopped at businesses that you patronize, a restaurant that you enjoyed, but not just the stuff that you enjoyed. It was your company, right? Some of you, uh, you put blood, sweat, and tears into starting a family business that you had to permanently shutter, and it's dramatically uh, impacted your life and your future. And, and so we've seen this, we, what we've seen is that this economic impact hit the lowest wage earners the most, where 47% of people who were surveyed said that they struggled to make their housing payment, whether that was a rent payment or a mortgage payment during this season, they've struggled to make those payments. 25% of people saying that during this pandemic season, they struggled to put food on the table, right? And so this isn't just a you know, someone somewhere on a street corner. This is many people, people that we know that are being directly and dramatically affected by this issue of poverty and joblessness and homelessness in our nation. And I know that it goes well beyond our nation across the globe. And so what do we do about it? I was thinking about this sermon thinking, man, if the government's throwing trillions of dollars of our money at these issues and it's not being solved, what are we gonna do about it? Well, that'll bring me back into what I've been preaching through during this sermon series, which is the letter to the Hebrew church, the early church that experienced tremendous persecution and suffering. So there was many people in the church who were losing their jobs, losing their homes, being mistreated cruelly, suffering economically, and then there was a whole other group of people that had a choice. Would they ignore the needs and the suffering of others, or would they be willing to give up what they have in order to help those who are suffering? And the letter to the Hebrew church is written to those two groups, to those that were suffering and those that were willing to identify with those that were suffering. And so it's really a letter of encouragement to, to encourage and inspire those that were willingly doing what love requires, motivated by faith. And as you go through the letter, you get to Hebrews chapter 11, where the author gives a, a, a really incredible list 
of ancient heroes of the faith who lived out their faith by doing what love required. They lived out the high price of love. And when you get to the end, he gives this flurried list. And so I'm going to jump in. I'm going to read it to you. It's found in Hebrews chapter 11, and we're going to start in verse 32. And I'm going to kind of read it rapidly, but you'll be able to keep up with me. But what more shall I say? I've given you all these examples. What more should I do? I don't have time to tell you about Gideon and Barak and Samson and Jephthah, about David and Samuel and the prophets. He doesn't even listen. He just goes, all these guys who are amazing prophets, who through faith conquered kingdoms, administered justice, and gained what was promised, who shut the mouths of lions, quenched the fury of the flames, and escaped the edge of the sword, whose weakness was turned into strength, and who became powerful in battle and routed foreign armies. Women received back their dead, raised to life again. And so he's giving this flurried list of people who experienced the miraculous hand of God and saw the impossible become possible. And as I read that, I was like, yes, more of that. More people who are suffering injustice, experiencing justice. More people who are, ex- are sick, being healed. More people who are suffering uh, the devastation of death, experiencing resurrection life on earth, right? That's what we want. But then you have to keep reading. Very next statement. There were others who were tortured, refusing to be released so that they might gain an even better resurrection. Some faced jeers and flogging, even chains and imprisonment. They were put to death by stoning. They were sawed in two. They were killed by the sword. They, were, they went about in sheepskins and goatskins, destitute, persecuted, and mistreated. What? What is he saying? He's saying there, there are people who they didn't get what the first group got. No, the, this group suffered. They endured hardship. I don't know about you, but if I had to choose a list, I want to be on the first list, not the second list. Nobody volunteers to be on the, on the second list. But what he, what he says is this. He goes, the difference is not their faith. Faith is not the distinguishing factor between those that suffered, endured suffering, and escaped suffering. Faith wasn't the distinguishing factor between those that experienced pain or pleasure. Faith seems to be a factor in what you do when you suffer. Faith does not decide whether you experience a miracle or misery, but faith invites miracles and strengthens you through the miseries of life. In fact, he summarizes it with this challenge regarding those that endured suffering. He says, okay, what do we do about this? The world was not worthy of them. They wandered in deserts and mountains, living in caves and holes in the ground. They were homeless. They were all commended for their faith, yet none of them received what had been promised since God had planned something better for us so that only together with us would they be made perfect. He's writing to a church that was both suffering and others who are willing to identify with the suffering. And he makes this critical and essential point. It's a principle that God gives better than what life can give or take. God gives better than what life can give or life can take from you. God is always better. Now, here, here's a challenge I was always opening, I was talking about this, this crisis of poverty and homelessness. But the reality is that whether you have much or you have little, whether you're experiencing poverty or prosperity, the reality is that every one of us are far more poor than we realize. We are in a greater poverty than we would dare to admit. And we're in poverty whether we know it or not, meaning even if you're prospering, you're just putting it on credit. I don't mean physically and financially. I mean spiritually. That's right. You and I are in a great spiritual debt. See, God does not see prosperity or poverty the way we do. If you are prospering 
financially, you may not be prospering spiritually. They don't, they're not equivalent to each other. And if you are suffering financially, that does not mean that you are suffering spiritually. Because the way God sees poverty and prosperity are very different. And, and so the reality is that every one of us are in a debt that we could never repay. That's right. You and I are in a spiritual debt brought on by sin. Sin is something that you and I were born with, where we were born with an instinct that separates us from relationship with God. And so every time we do something wrong, we think something wrong, we say something wrong, we, we, we mistreat someone, we have a wrong attitude, a wrong thought, we get angry and we lash out, we're, we're charging the credit card of sin. And, and the first time you charge, it immediately creates an instant debt that there's nothing you could ever do to pay it off. You could live your whole life. You could do, you could do forever good. And no matter what good you do, it will never be enough to pay off the credit card of sin. Because all of that good would at best pay the minimum balance so that all of eternity, you would only be paying the minimum balance and the debt would just continue to go on and on and on. And so the reality is you and I carry a debt spiritually. And we feel it, don't we? We feel like we're in poverty no matter what we have. It's never enough. And if you don't, if you lose something, whatever you lose, uh, you, you feel the lack, you feel the need. I don't, when, I'm, when I'm losing it, I, I've lost everything. But even when you have more than enough, it's never enough, is it? And so this is why Jesus came, to deal with our spiritual bankruptcy, our spiritual debt. You know, the, this spiritual debt gets passed on generation after generation, a little bit like our, our national debt, except that no one ever pays it off. And so what does Jesus do? He comes from heaven to earth to take on our spiritual debt. He says, I'll take that from you. And I want you to know that when Jesus went to the cross, he was dying to pay your eternal death sentence. You, you owed a debt you could never pay. And so Jesus said, I'll, I'll take that shame. I'll take that guilt. I'll take that sin on myself. And so he died once for all, absorbing our debt, paying, off our, paying, paying our way out of our bankruptcy, absorbing the eternal death sentence, and he died once for all. So that anyone who believes in Jesus by faith is forgiven, debt forgiven, like this whole debt forgiveness. He didn't just give you a stimulus package. He didn't just take it from one person and give it to the next. No, he, God took it from himself. He paid the, he leveraged his riches and his, he gave his life to pay our debt. But he didn't just forgive, he gives. Because he rose from the dead and in his resurrection, he defeated the power of sin. He freed us from the debt of eternal judgment so that now, not only are we forgiven, but we're given new and forever life. And if you want that, man, you've been feeling a spiritual bankruptcy. Maybe you have a lot physically, but you know you don't have a lot inwardly or spiritually. Or maybe you're suffering in the physical realm, and that physical suffering it reveals a deeper suffering. And what you need is forgiveness. You need to be forgiven and given new life through Jesus. Would you just receive that by faith? That's what this whole chapter is about, how through faith, we experience God. Would you say yes to Jesus? And if you're making that commitment, would you let us know? Text the name Jesus to 81411. Seriously, I, I know you're watching online. I know you're on your device or you're watching on a, a smart TV or a computer, whatever. Would you take a moment, grab your phone and just shoot us a quick text. I know it's nearby. Text the name Jesus to 81411. You're saying yes to Jesus. You're saying yes to that debt being forever paid in full. You're saying yes to the bankruptcy being uh, paid, uh, you know, the, that bankruptcy being canceled and God forgiving and giving you new life. Now, what do you do? Now, now, you believe in Jesus by faith. You may suffer or you may have to identify with those that are suffering. Here's what I know, that through faith, God is always better than what this life can give or take. What that means is this. There is nothing this life can give that will be better than what God is, who God is, and what God gives. And there is nothing life can take from you that will ever take what God is and what God gives in your life. Meaning if you have much, 
Faith reminds you that God is better than your best. If you have little, faith reminds you that God is more than enough in your life. So in those moments, when you have more than enough, you're reminded that God is more than enough. And when you have little, when you're suffering, when you're going through difficulty, faith reminds you that I am never without through faith in God. If you're facing death and God spares you from death, faith reminds you that eternal life is better than just surviving in this life. And if you're facing death or someone you love faces death and they transition through death from this life to eternal life, they're remind, we, they, we are reminded by faith that life doesn't end in death. Death ends in forever life, right? Who I have in God is better than anything this life can give or take. I am not richer for what I have in this life, and I am not poor for what I lose in this life. Listen to what the author says in, in uh, Hebrews chapter 11, verse 39 through 40, about how we respond to those who are suffering. He says this, the, um, these were all commended for their faith, yet none of them received what had been promised, since God planned something better for us, that only together with us they would be made perfect. He, he makes this point that they were not fully fulfilled in this life. They were looking ahead to receive what was promised. And so the key here, as he's going through all these people that are suffering, the key is this, that we willingly identify and give dignity to the suffering of others. It's kind of the point of what he's writing and who he's writing to. They were willing to identify with the pain and the suffering of fellow Christians. And by the way, anyone you meet, even if they don't believe in Jesus, they might be a pre-Christian. They're either a Christian or a pre-Christian. And so what he's saying is these many people within the church willingly identified with the suffering and the poverty and the pain of others. Others who may not be experiencing the good things of this life, but they're looking ahead to the promise of forever life. Things in this world are not always as they seem to be. In fact, many things are upside down. And so imagine this, in one of the statements, he goes, the world was not worthy of them. What? What a statement. The world is not worthy of them? Here's what he was saying. Christians who suffer, who are persecuted, Christians in poverty, Christians who are sick and dying, Christians who are homeless are a gift to the world around them. How could he say that? He's saying because when you watch a Christian suffer, you watch someone who believes in Jesus by faith experience poverty and homelessness, you're seeing a promise because their hope is not in this life. So the promise you see is that they are looking ahead to the riches of eternity. The gift that they give you is that you and I are reminded that this is not the best of life. This is not all that life has to offer. Our true life is in forever life. The true gift of God is not in what I get in this life, but what I have in eternal life. When, I'm, when I watch someone suffering in sickness, it, it's a gift to remind me that my health is not the best there is. When I watch someone suffering in homelessness, it's a reminder, it's a gift that I'm not home yet. We're not home yet. And so he gives dignity to those that are suffering. He, he says that the homeless in your neighborhood, in your city, they're not the problem. They're a gift. They're a reminder that we're not home yet. And they're not just a metaphor. They, as people, are commended for their faith as they suffer well. Remember, Jesus embraced poverty. He was born into oppression, into suffering, into hardship. But Jesus wasn't just born into it. He identified with the, the sick the dying, those that had no clothes, those that were in prison, right? He goes, when you did it to the least of these, you did it for me. If you didn't care for them, 
You weren't caring for me. Right? If Jesus is willing to identify with poverty and experience it himself, if he's willing to give dignity to the, those that are poor and homeless, then certainly we need to change our perspective and recognize that those that are suffering, those in poverty, those that are homeless, they are a gift to us because they remind us that this is not the best, that there is a better life coming. And so then what do you do about this? Well, if you read just a little bit further in the letter to the Hebrews, you get to uh, chapter 13, verse 3, where he says this, Continue to remember those in prison as if you were together with them in prison. And continue to remember those who are suffering. Right? He goes, remember those who are mistreated as if you yourselves were suffering. What is the point? He goes, he's not just saying remember them. Don't be like, oh, that's right, my buddy is in prison. Or, oh, that's right, my, my neighbor is being mistreated. No, no. The remembrance means to sacrifice for them. And so the key here is sacrifice for the well-being of others. Sacrifice for the well-being of others. That, that doesn't mean that we're waiting for the government to tax us or tax someone else to pay off the bill. It doesn't mean that we're waiting for another multi-trillion dollar uh, stimulus package or whatever is coming. We're not waiting for another government program or for someone else to start a nonprofit to meet their needs. We, we recognize that we are the response of God to the suffering of those around us. They are a gift from God to show us that this is not the best of life, that what I, if I have, I, I have more in eternity. If I have enough, God is more than enough. And if I have little, God is still more than enough. I'm reminded that I need to be reminded that those that are in prison, those that are mistreated, those that are suffering, those that are in poverty, those that are homeless, I am called to sacrifice in order to be the response of God to them. That's right. You and I are the response of God to those around us. We're the response of God to the needy and the hurting, the homeless and those in poverty. We are the response of God to the hungry and the hurting. So when we think, how, what, does, what is God doing about this? What God is doing about this issue in our community, in our home, in our schools, is he's giving us a heart to hurt with them. He gives us the gift of sacrificial generosity. God is a giver. God gave to us. He gave his one and only son. And then after God gave us his one and only son, he lavishes on us his grace, the riches of heaven, his comforts, his, his kindness, his peace, his goodness, his generosity. And so we reflect that generosity through our sacrificial generosity. And when you sacrifice gener gener with generosity, you both reveal God's generosity and you invite God's generosity. That's right. Your generosity reveals and invites God's generosity. God shows up when you're generous, and then he's also generous to and through you. I'd encourage you, if you're not right now, giving to and through the church, would you begin? We, we call that, uh, it's, it's a response, the principle of sacrificial generosity following a pattern of tithing. So I willingly give up 10% of my income to God through the church. Right? And when we respond to the, when we give to the church, the church is able to respond to those in the church and in the community. We're able to vet those programs and organizations that we partner with. We're able to vet organizations across the globe that we're willing to partner with and help appropriately respond to the needs in our community, in our church, and across the globe. Would you begin to give? But we don't just give to God. We don't just give to the church. We give to the poor. And so are you responding to the needs around you? Let me, let me give you a challenge. God doesn't give you more so you can have more, but so you can give more. And you're also challenged to live on less, to give more. I mean, I'm not waiting for a raise or a promotion or hitting the lottery. I'm going to live on less. I'm going to identify with the poor by giving up so I can give more. What step of faith do you need to take to give? To give to God, to give through the church, to give to go, those in need. And what happens when we begin to live like this? Well, we're reminded, uh, it's the last time I'm gonna challenge you with this, but in Hebrews chapter 11, verse 10, one of these heroes of the faith, it says this about him. He was looking forward to the city with foundations whose architect and builder is God. And as I've gone through this series, what I've said is this. Um, all of these heroes of the faith, whether they endured suffering or escaped suffering, 
whether they saw miracles or misery, they were looking ahead in hope to heaven. But while they were looking forward to this city of God in eternity, they were working to make the city they were in look more like the city of God. And our sacrificial generosity, our willingness to identify with the sufferings of others, to give dignity to those that are hurting, to uh, recognize that the hurting and the suffering are a gift to us, it turns our community, our homes, our cities, in the cities that look a little bit more like the city of God. You are the response of God to those around you. And so I, I'm hoping that as I, I've spoken, you've been encouraged and challenged. Maybe you recognized your spiritual poverty and are willing to allow God to forgive you of sin and give you new life. Maybe you're recognizing that you don't have more. You, you, God's not giving you more so you can have more, but so you can give more. Maybe you're willing to take a hard step of living on less to give more because you're willing to identify with the sufferings of others. We take a moment and just pray over you as you think about that next step, a legitimate, real, practical next step of how you can live by faith and before your neighborhood, your city. Jesus, thank you. Thank you that you are willing to identify with our suffering, the suffering that comes from sin, from death and eternal judgment that you not only identify with us, but you took it on yourself. You, you said that our pain was your pain and our sin would become your sacrifice. So you were giving your life for us. And God, we receive that by faith. And we know that you don't just give us that we can hoard, but God, so we can help. So God, would you pour your generosity in us to pour it through us? You give us more so that we could give more. Empower us to live on less to give more. May we be the response of God in our own homes, our neighborhoods, to the individuals around us, and the response of God for our city. In Jesus' name, amen.